I'm so happy with all the developments and particularly January 16th, the thousand day was crossed, a big yep. monumental event. And in the audience, welcome very, very much to Conversations. Our, our guest is Sonia Ahmad, and she was a partner with uh, a young man, or young, he's uh, middle-aged, but in his prime, Reed Stowe, who's a good friend of myself and a great deal of the world, and may be recalled by the people in the audience, and I think he should be brought more into their attention than perhaps uh, it is at the moment. Mm -hmm. But he's the person who, let me give a quick rundown, as a young man, he fashioned and built with his own hands, lovingly, a, from the timber, a 70-foot gaff rig schooner down in North Carolina and set sail on the oceans of the world with that that he, he fashioned and built the boat himself, he and mm -hmm. Wave and the family. Mm -hmm. And then they sailed, he sailed that into Antarctica and other kinds of things. And then some time ago, actually it was April 21 of the year 2007, after a great deal of preparation, sailed onto the oceans of the world with the, with, the, with the announced task of sailing out of sight of land and with no resupply for a full 1,000 days called the Mars uh, uh, Ocean Odyssey, which is a, uh, that comes from the fact that it's about the time it takes to either go to or a return trip to Mars, testing the limits of human endurance in challenging uh, conditions and on this voyage, he had accompanying him our guest, Sonia Ahmad, who was with him and sailed out down from Hoboken on the Hudson River out into the great oceans of the world. And she's billed on this program as 306 days uh, that she was on the Anne, the name of the, of the schooner, and then had to be put aside, uh, put ashore at Perth, Amboy, came here and has given birth to a beautiful baby boy. What's mm -hmm. his name again? Darshan. Darshan. He's coming along fine, I understand. Yes. 16 months he's, old. Yes, he's 18 months, and he's um, starting to walk and talk a bit. And yeah, aren't they yeah. wonderful? Yeah. Aren't they just <laughs> wonderful? I know. I can remember when we had that. But anyway, I'm happy to report that we met again after a long time, uh, Sonia and I, at on January 16 of this year, because mm -hmm. that was the day when Reed, who continued on the voyage, uh, out of sight of land, no resupply, is like a biosphere. Almost. Where they live on the oceans of the world. Mm -hmm. It's really an amazing event, and he crossed the 1,000 day uh, mark, mm -hmm. as he had set out for, and is to put the frosting on the cake, as they say, he's gonna stay at sea longer and come back to uh, New York mm -hmm. in June. Yeah. What a story. What an incredible story. And Sonia, welcome. Thank you. So very, very much to conversation. It's really good to see you again. Yeah, you too. Mm hmm Well, I sort of laid it out, I guess, there. Then. And we're going to okay. show a little bit of footage. Okay. Uh -huh. But that's the, that's the, uh, the, uh, the, the outline mm -hmm. of the situation. And you were out there for 306 yeah. days. Must have been quite an adventure, huh? Oh, yes, it was. Um, when Reed and I left with the intention of doing a thousand days nonstop at sea, um, that's almost three years at sea without resupplying. And it was just the two of us on the boat, and mm. our, we intended to go um, sail with the winds and the currents of the world and um, spend that much time. There was no intention to go to land or to see land. Um, it was just about the time spent at sea. And no resupply. Without resupplying. So we had to take everything with us. Um, and we had all the food we needed. We had ways of generating electricity through solar panels. Mm -hmm. And um, all the food, all the gear, spare equipment. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's a huge undertaking. Absolutely. Uh, it's like an adventure. And it's like pushing the limits and so mm -hmm. forth. And it, it, I just congratulate you and Reed uh, on uh, accomplishing the thousand days <laughs> and Thank on you. the whole the whole venture is like an adventure and it's also very uh, entrepreneur, I mean, it's pushing in a creative kind of way. It's yeah. a mark of self-reliance. It is. And all kinds of really important human values, yeah. Yeah, yeah there's, a, there's a huge green aspect to this voyage. Mm -hmm. I know when I returned, I was so super conscious of all the resources that I was using mm -hmm. on land, even though 
on land, you know, we have r abundance, yeah. relatively speaking. We have replacements, and there's a variety of, there's choices of what you can use and not use. Yeah. But on the boat, you know, we had to use what we had w mm -hmm. brought with us. And, um, and the water usage, we had to be very conservative with that because we didn't know when we'd get water again. Uh, it depends on where in the ocean you are. Mm -hmm. And um, we had to reuse whatever we could. Mm -hmm. We didn't want to throw things out into the ocean because, you know, you see the garbage floating there. It's, it's not nice. You become very aware of how all of your actions and, and what you do in your everyday life, how it affects the environment around you. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a very um, green and sustainable kind of venture that we were on. But... Um, not exactly because we set out to do something that was ecologically friendly. Mm -hmm. It just turned out that way because living on a boat, you have to be conservative and you have to be very aware of your environment because your environment, the wind, the water, the weather, all those things directly affect you and you have to respond to them accordingly. Mm -hmm. I have as a hero of mine, philosophically and so forth, a man named Buckminster Fuller. Mm -hmm. And he was, a, uh, he was an, uh, a design person and had a great reading of the human condition, but he was a very brilliant polymath. But he had been in the Navy for a mm -hmm. while, and he had said that when you're on a ship, and he would compare things to a ship, things have to be, there's the term, ship shape. Mm -hmm. You have to be thoughtful and give yeah. thought to the way things are done, uh, that it, it, it's good training for consciousness. Yeah, it, I suppose it would be the same. Definitely, uh, uh, things have to be ship-shaped because um, one of the biggest things about a boat, besides the very small confined spaces, yeah, uh -huh. and each space you use for two or three different purposes, you yes, know, it's not uh -huh. like you have your living room and your bedroom, you know, mm. sometimes it's just the same thing. Yeah. Um, but also, there's the idea of... Um, uh, <laughs> Ship shape, things in yeah. order, good design. Yeah, the, sense of the, the design. motion, the yeah. motion that. Uh, oh, I see. Uh -huh. Yeah, the motion that the boat is always under. Yeah. Right, you have to always be aware of that. Otherwise, um, you, things will fall. You can't put something down. Mm -hmm. You have to think about where you're putting it, and when you're leaving it, then you have to think about well, otherwise it'll go flying room and you know could hurt you at, yeah. at some point. And you don't want to like leave things around um, and say, oh yes, I'll secure it later because. Yeah. Um, weather could change immediately and the last thing you're thinking about is that, you know, that book that you left laying somewhere. It's flying through the yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You know, it's falling down and it, it, it's like a projectile, it's dangerous. So you really have to have things in shape. You have to... Ship shape. Exactly. Ship yes. shape. Yeah. In, in its place, um, not being messy and secure and also always being aware of, of um, the... the space that you're in. Right, yeah. right, and that, that's something that has a great echo in terms of a sense of ecological configuration mm -hmm. on a larger tableau. Right, right. yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's good ecological training and everything, right? Could you share a little bit of your own background? You're living in Queens now, I know. Yes. But could you share just a little bit of that? And then we got a, some footage we want to show. We have some footage off YouTube of the day you guys sailed out from Hoboken, mm -hmm. and we'll talk that. Yeah. Could you share your own background a little bit, okay. please? Well, I um, was born in Queens and mm. raised in Queens, mm. New York, and um, I uh, attended co the City College of New York, mm. and uh, I was studying for a photography degree. Okay. Um, and that's when I met Reed, mm -hmm. when I was studying for my photography. He was birthed down in uh, he was, uh, yes. Chelsea Pier? He was there? docked on what was then Pier 63 mm -hmm. um, on the west side of mm -hmm. Manhattan, mm -hmm. and I was taking pictures of the piers, and that's where I met him. He mm -hmm. was... Um, and um, I took pictures of his boat, and I brought the pictures back the next week, and um, that's how we started. Mm -hmm. And um, I finished getting my degree, mm -hmm. and oh, I, okay. I went uh, off to another school to get a second degree in mm -hmm. maritime technology. And, uh, because of meeting him? No, I just had a, a, an interest in the water. You did? I you did. You had that separate from the contract Well, yes, that's read. how I got to the um, docks in the first that's, place. Oh, you so know, you I was the, doing photography. You're, you were in photography, but you were interested in maritime, and the maritime took you to the docks to get some photography of the maritime <laughs> world, right? Well, yes, okay. yes. Okay, um, it's funny the way things work. Yeah, it's it? just one after the other. Now, one thing leads to another. If you hadn't had both photography and the maritime, you might not have met Reed. Your life might have been completely different, Yeah, right? it, it, exactly. You know, one little change like like this can just change your whole life, you yeah. know, when you think about it and mm -hmm. everything. But that's how you met with Reed, that's, though. Yeah, huh? that's how I met Reed. How 
How did you develop the interest in the maritime, if I may, on your own? Um, I, okay, I started college in, uh, um, as an architecture major. Really? Okay. Uh, actually, landscape architecture. I had that interest. Ian McHarg. Did you know Ian McHarg? No. Okay. I, I, okay. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to bring up, but he's somebody you'll have to Google. Okay. If you're into landscape mm -hmm. architect, Ian McHarg. Okay. okay. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, um, and uh, after two years of doing architecture, I decided architecture was not for me. So I decided... Why? Oh, well, it was a lot of technical drawing, yeah. and it was a lot of model making, and yeah. um, I was more interested in perhaps the visual aspects and um, the conceptual aspects of architecture rather than the putting together models and drawing. Okay. And, and photography kind of provided this alternative outlet f for, my, um, for the way I saw things. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I could take pictures of buildings and, and you know, uh, worry about composition in a different way than I was thinking about it in architecture. Yes, I can see that very well. Yeah. And so, um, so I, that's why I switched to photography. Mm -hmm. And um, at, during one of my photography projects in, in a class, um, I thought to myself, well, I've studied the city and the structures in the city, but what happens on the edges of the city, right. you know, uh, where building meets water? there must be some kind of edge effect happening. Absolutely, yeah. So I decided to do a, a kind of visual study as to what was going on on the edges of the city and mm -hmm. how it relates to the city and all that. Mm -hmm. And so I found myself walking the docks of um, New York City mm -hmm. and taking pictures of boats and, and seeing what was happening, what the different businesses were that mm -hmm. were happening on the waterfront, right. um, uh, what kind of people hung out on the waterfront. And uh, eventually, I went beyond New York City, and I photographed other cities as well. You did? Yes. Uh -huh. um, and so that was my interest in the water. And um, meeting Reed, it was just kind of part of it. You know, it was like I was not, it was not my, ma my focus. It was just a part of what I had been learning about. Yeah. yeah. But it fit right in. Yes, it did. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Those, and he, are, he was, those are the things that make life interesting. And he yeah. was very different because while everybody, uh, there was a lot of tourism and there was a lot of um, business and, you know, the usual. Um, Hullabaloo. <laughs> right, on the water, yeah. like, you know, the sewage and the tugboats and um, the water taxi and all that. Yeah. Reed was kind of different because not only was he living on board a boat, which is a little bit unusual in New York mm -hmm. City, mm -hmm. he was um, doing something that I've never heard of anyone doing before, which mm -hmm. was going away at sea for a thousand days, going away at sea to be at sea for this very long time. Most people, when they get on a boat, they're either cruising, they're going to some place from point A to point B, mm -hmm. or they're racing mm -hmm. in some kind of competition. Mm -hmm. But here was a guy who was not racing, mm -hmm. he was not cruising, and he wasn't trying to get anywhere. Mm -hmm. So his whole concept was very unique. Yes, indeed. I think he's also a real artist, mm -hmm. painter and sculptor. Yes. And he's got a great deal of concern with ecology and with things spiritual. Mm -hmm. And he's, a, he's very much of a... Uh, He's very much of a man of action, obviously. Mm -hmm. He's an adventurer mm -hmm. in a very sense. Yeah. We're pushing the, he took that and that boat down into Antarctica, mm -hmm. and he had set world records. I think he was 19 or something. He went across the North Atlantic in a catamaran or something. Yeah. Um, I mean, he was just a kid. He was 20 years old. He yeah. built that himself, too. Yeah, he built the catamaran very himself. Very pushy guy, right? <laughs> yeah, from, yeah. I, I guess but you have to be born with it. Very beautiful guy. Very sensitive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. He's not. He's not the aggressive type mm. uh, in terms aggressive, of. He's uh, aggressive in terms of pushing the limits of uh, right, endurance. Right. Right. Yeah. It's all about how far he could push himself. But mm -hmm. he uh, he's a very polite to other people and very um, you know gentle and I no he's not aggressive at all. No, I know. I <laughs> in know. that respect. No, in that re <laughs> I understand what you're saying exactly. That's really interesting. Uh, so you went ahead, and I can remember we were there a few of us. And one of the things I'd ask you right now. Or let me let me interject. We got a couple of clips we're going to show, mm -hmm. and sometime in the booth, maybe you want to just bring up, if you can, the um, the home page. And I'm going to say it now, and we'll say it again later, because there is a uh, a site, and uh, uh, it's called uh, www.1000days. The number mm -hmm. 1000days.net, mm -hmm. and it's got and it, people who are there. He is. We got it on the screen now, mm -hmm. and that's you and Reed at the. Uh, 
you know, at the at the front page. And uh, there, he tried, Reed tried. I, I don't, I, uh, Reed. I know I've done programs with him and so forth, and a lot of people have. But he was trying to get for this venture, which mm -hmm. is a major venture, uh, real what would be called real corporate and or major media coverage of mm -hmm. the fact that he was going to do this thing. Yeah. And I think it's fair to say he was not able to realize that. No. He tried, but he couldn't get it. Right. One of the questions is, why isn't there interest on the part of the media mm -hmm. or upon the major players of the society mm -hmm. in such a momentous event? Mm -hmm. And I'd like to follow it up, if I could. Mm -hmm. I had um, occasion to be at a round table, intellectually oriented uh, dinner mm -hmm. at the Chelsea Hotel down mm -hmm. on 23rd Street. And sitting to my left was a man who I just, where everybody was talking, he happened to be a surgeon, a hand surgeon, mm -hmm. very educated man. But he was also chairman of the committee at the Explorers Club, mm -hmm. the most prestigious uh, uh, institution that celebrates geographical discovery, Stanley mm -hmm. Livingston and all that sort of thing, uh, Burton and Speak and that but also those who have pushed the limits of human endurance, the Explorers Club. I think it's the most prestigious uh, institution in that regard. And we were talking about other things, including Reed. Mm -hmm. He had been out there for a few hundred days or something. And he said to me, he happened to be chairman of the committee for inductees to that. Mm -hmm. uh, and he said that if Reed pulls that off, and we were looking out two or three or four or 500 days he had to go, mm -hmm. if he managed to pull that off, he is going to be enshrined within that institution right up there with the top explorers or fulfilling the mission, a human mission, of exploring. Mm -hmm. That would be exploring in uh, you know, geographical new territory mm -hmm. or the limits of human endurance mm -hmm. is what they celebrate. He'd be right up there with Sir Edmund Hillary mm -hmm. who first climbed the uh, Himalaya, you mm -hmm. know, the Mount yeah. Everest and right. everything. So what, one of the things I don't understand, why didn't the major media in the past, mm -hmm. or now for that matter, now that Reed has actually met that, uh, set that record, mm -hmm. that monumental record of being there, setting this, why is it do you think that they did not then when he set out, mm -hmm. and now, or maybe even more importantly, why in the world is the major media not picking up on this monumental study, heroic study, of a fantastic uh, example of pushing the limits, this story that is such a, a, a so dramatic and so important, and I wonder maybe you do you have any thought on that? Why well, has not the great networks and everything <laughs> following him and so forth, not to sell short the fact that so many people that got into his corner, some of the best cyber people, Carter Emirat at the Hayden Planetarium mm -hmm. is following and so forth, mm -hmm. but what do you think about that? Uh, because we're here to celebrate the fact that he made the thousand days right. just a week or so ago, yeah. of course. Well, when Reed started out, um, he, he conceived as a voyage uh, 20 years ago. Yes. And uh, for a good deal of that time, he was uh, pitching, pitching the voyage to everyone he could get. He made up proposals. He um, uh, tried to get corporate sponsorship. Um, but no, no corporation had stepped up. Um, and, and said, okay, we'll back you. Or a media, and, a and media no, entity could be following right. it. Yeah. But I think also with uh, um, <coughs> corporate sponsorship, with a corporate backing, you get media with that also. Yeah. But without it, why hasn't the media picked up on this story? I don't know. We've gotten some articles here and there and some stories done, but why hasn't it gotten major press? I'm not sure. I think part of the reason is that the whole voyage, the whole concept of the voyage is very different from what most people know and and because of that it's hard to categorize categorize the story or what he's doing for one thing it's an entrepreneurial thing it's a thing of a yeah, person it's, it's very individually different. doing it it's yeah. not like uh, nasa right a, it's not an organization of dollars right. to get to the moon or something and it's a big event out of cape cavanaugh it's yeah. an individual it's one a small uh, grassroots effort on a shoestring budget you uh -huh. know um and so we're relatively unknown but I predict yeah. that's going to change. I hope so. <laughs> in the time ahead. I think when it dawns, mm -hmm. particularly when the spirit of the entrepreneur or somebody doing something individually, like an artist, mm -hmm. doing something and pushing a limits and then succeeding at it mm -hmm. and the implications of it, I, I think that there's going to be a major pickup on that. And maybe, did I say at the introduction that he 
has put the frosting on the cake. He's not coming up back to New York until June. Yeah, well, that's not so much a matter of frosting as it is a matter of safety. Okay, um, really? Coming back to New York City Harbor um, in January is the peak of um, the storms in the Atlantic, the winter weather. Uh, makes makes the ocean a little bit rough, and Reed's boat is has already seen so many hundreds of days at sea. Absolutely, um, that it's it's a little worn, mm -hmm. and I don't think he wants to take the risk of coming back in a storm. Really, so he mm -hmm. preferred to wait until the stormy season is over, and June has better weather. So that's why he's decided to come back in June. So he goes a thousand days, and you it's like the lonely. You ever see the movie The Loneliness of Long Distance Runner? <laughs> I mean, that's a movie that has Tom Courtney and everything, but that's a, uh, he goes a thousand days, which mm -hmm. is a major event, and then you <laughs> you get to the end of it, and you say, well, we'll just go another uh, few hundred days. How many more days is that? That's going to be another... Uh, it's going to be about another 150, 151 days. Not 151 days, and we've got to realize, the man's living on this 70-foot gaff rig schooner mm -hmm. the sails are starting to be worn yeah and I understand we're going to talk about some of the communication we've been able to do with the iridium and mm -hmm. and Carter and that kind of stuff mm -hmm. but um, you know the, the, the it's wearing out and those sails and you have to not only keep the thing ship shape you also have to keep everything in good repair yeah exactly and, and especially at sea when the constant motion can make things rub against each other yeah. and wear out very quickly and the salt water yeah. can get to things and corrode corrode all different tiny parts that you wouldn't even realize you know is doing such an important job those things wear away and you have to replace them mm -hmm. and you know um, it's it's a it's a constant job to maintain the schooner do you think there's a prejudice against an individual doing something that isn't part of a great big bureaucratic behemoth? Do you understand an yeah. individual? There mm -hmm. seems to be the thought that an individual can do anything, uh, you know, like Daniel Boone, mm -hmm. or you move or everything like that, right. that that's gone out of style, that we think everything can only be done by group uh, yeah. activity and you got to get the whole government involved or the whole thing, but for some one person to do something, they're looking down on that? Or what, I don't, I, I have no idea. <laughs> I okay, have no idea. You can't figure it out no. either, right? Why uh, there is I, Reed and I have both tried, you know, uh, putting forth various theories as to why we haven't gotten as much Major attention, attention yeah. Yeah, um, as something like this would deserve. I don't know. Yeah. It's an interesting question, sociologically, politically, media. Mm -hmm. I'm glad we're able to get some attention to it here. Yeah. Maybe this could get through to some... You, what a wonderful thing it would be to have a little report on the McNeil Lair or something. Reed's out there, and oh, let, let, let's put that aside now for a minute. Um, he did get the backing of some of the best cyber people in the world and some of the most important people. He, they call it his ground crew, right? Yeah. Like, like in a yeah, Our onshore uh, team. Well, onshore yeah. team, yeah, yeah. Uh, Paul, Paul um, Slack has helped mm -hmm. and Carter Emberett, mm -hmm. who is the director of astrovisualization at Hayden Planetarium, has mm -hmm. stayed in touch with them. Mm -hmm. They've been able to track it. Mm -hmm. And he did get the use of what's called an iridium telephone yeah. to be able to communicate back, right? Mm -hmm. And then also he had a computer yeah. Because there were many reports, uh, written reports from the from yeah, the um, we, in the various oceans of the world, and yeah. also occasional picture, mm -hmm. a single picture. But it's not like you had a satellite transponder connection with ongoing uh, television no. or something. No, no, we didn't. We didn't have internet access mm -hmm. uh, on the boat, but we were able to send small emails through satellite to. Um, people on land. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, we had our computers and um, almost every day Reed and I would write a blog and after mm -hmm. I left Reed would continue with the blog writing. Uh -huh. um, and he would, uh, we would take a picture and we would send it with our blogs mm -hmm. and you can see that on our website. Yeah. Um, and then the computer broke and we were not able to how send many, that. How many days out was that or do you remember? When, when the they, computer broke? Yeah. Well, it was uh, it was in December, uh, so it was very near to the thousand day mark. Um, and you couldn't just take it down to the corner repair shop. <laughs> no, of course not. We you were see, if, yeah, we see. were a thousand miles. From, well, he Reed was a thousand miles from people, land, civilization. You know, so he was on his Amazing own. Amazing story. And, Amazing story. Yeah, um, and he had a spare computer. But that was the spare computer that he was using. Both computers were gone by the time day 1000 arrived. But it had, um, one of the computers had lasted 
well over a year. And in that salt environment, I think we on the onshore team was pretty amazed that it lasted that long. Do we dare say which computer served well? And wouldn't that be a great brand ad for an <laughs> ad for the computer that stood up so well? And couldn't it have gone with million dollar campaigns to cover the fact that that computer was being delivering this great monumental event? And where the hell is the ad industry <laughs> not taking advantage of taking this story, branding it yeah. and making it available to the white and turning them into an international <laughs> global hero. Yeah, Why? I don't know. I think it's due for that, don't you? Yes, definitely. Okay. And you, the heroine. Okay, mm -hmm. let's not forget, you've also set a record for a, a woman at mm -hmm. sea, 306 days. Yeah. How did you like it at sea? Oh, um, I, <laughs> I, I liked it a lot, actually. Yeah. It was, um, I had never been on the ocean before going out on, never even on to up this. The Hudson well, we went up and down the Hudson in the, in the schooner yeah. um, in the year before leaving. Mm -hmm. That was the extent of my uh, sailing experience. Uh -huh. And then we, when we got on the ocean, I wasn't sure how I would be able to take it, you know. Um, you sure? But uh, I managed pretty well, I think. Um, after about a week of seasickness, I got used to it, and um, you know we were just living our lives the way anyone would, but yeah. except we were on the ocean. Yeah. And uh, but then I began to experience more nausea, and I thought that was because we were entering into the Southern Ocean, and this was a rougher place. And around we, Cape Hope or Cape Cape. Yeah. Cape. Um, the one around South Africa. Yeah, right? South Africa. Yeah, into the Atl Indian Ocean. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and How many days was that into the voyage? Oh, that was um, uh, about 250 that's a lot. or something. 250 <laughs> days is a lot. Um, that's the yeah. better part of a year. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so that was when I started to get sick again. Mm -hmm. And uh, from that moment on, I wouldn't say it was very pleasant mm -hmm. <laughs> because for, uh, for two months I was pretty much confined to a bed because I, was just, I just could not get up. To and as, do as, anything. It, as it happened, you were having morning sickness. Right? Yes, yeah, and right. I got off the boat. At um, Perth, if I understand. Yes, yeah. in Australia, mm -hmm. uh, a boat came out, and uh, I was transferred to that boat, and mm -hmm. it went back to shore uh, in Australia, and then I flew back to New York City. Right. Uh -huh. And uh -huh. a few months later, and Reed went back out to begin. Yeah, the Reed continued again. onwards. How many days is that? Three hundred and six, right? That was three hundred and six days That's when I got off the boat, and that was ten months at sea. Nearly a year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Yeah. Three, it's a, a, a thousand days would have been over, what, nearly three, three years, nearly. Yes. He went in April 21 of 2007. Mm -hmm. He left to cast, cast off mm -hmm. with the ad and sail, and they sailed past the dock, you guys on the boat. It was high adventure. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was like Columbus sailing off yeah. or something. It really <laughs> was. And yeah. that there was no major press there. Um, there there was. There was a... Uh, I believe two network television um, news stations. Uh, we were, had a brief spot on the news, on the evening news. Um, it should have and, been plastered all over <laughs> Times Square, darling. And they I, should have been up on a globo on Times Square and the whole of everybody covering it for crying out loud. And I believe, What's with those yeah. fellows at the network? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I believe Associated Press and a few assorted magazines and some sailing magazines also did. Um, uh, a story on our departure. Okay, well, okay. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm going to try, uh, you understand, I, I don't understand, well, there's a lot of things I don't understand about <laughs> the world, what, uh, what the world calls important and everything like mm -hmm. that. Uh, but we do have, and maybe in the booth you can get yourself prepared, because we have a couple of clips that happen to be up on YouTube, and maybe we could show them, because one sort of sets a couple minutes only, mm -hmm. Uh, sort of sets the theme and, and, and yeah. so forth. And then we have another one of some footage of the very day when you all sailed away and mm -hmm. we'd sing goodbye to his mother and all that. Yeah. And it's kind of nice and let people have a look at the fellow and yourself at the start of this. So if we could set it up in the, in the booth, please, or in the control room to run that first tape. It's about two minutes long. And uh, it was, um, it sort of sets the tone for this back when this, uh, the, this venture was uh, being initiated. And if you could set it up, just start rolling that tape now, because that's a tape from the day that you set sail. Mm -hmm. Again, on September 20, no, it was April 21, mm -hmm. 2007. Because you can from that hat. here, the main mast, I guess you'd call that. And boy, oh boy, something else. Some other people want to sell But once she was with him, she doesn't see me on top of her. Oh, thanks a lot. Yeah. 
Beach. Yeah. Oh yeah! Oh, she she a lot of people here who have made this way possible, and we couldn't have done it without you. And it goes back longer than the ten years that we've been. There's Carter. There's Carter. Oh. <laughs> 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 if you missed the back in three years. <laughs> that we've uh, been trying to get this voyage together. But there's a real team of supporters who have given so much to help make this voyage possible and make it happen. Starting with my mom and dad. Yeah! <laughs> All right! Yeah. And there's so many people here who've helped, and I thank you so much for making it possible. We're going to do the best we can out there. We know you are. Okay. We'll see you in three yeah. years, baby. Yeah. Get the headline from... Uh, Sail up and they're gonna get out of there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Bon voyage. They're gonna sail out a little bit. They're gonna go out oh, away. Yeah. They're now <laughs> <laughs> slipped the steely bound and are on the great ocean waves. Coming back in there's your problem. back here that very day because I brought some of the footage and we had a party in, Lu in commemoration of you and Reed <laughs> uh, with a group called The Colors which is a brilliantly uh, creative group of artists who do a, a, a program in the studio and we had footage of you guys sailing but they do a lot of mixing video mixing mm -hmm. it gets to be high art 
I swear to God, every program it gets to be where they're in high art, they're really good with music and mixing and everything. And we have pictures of you sailing past the, on the day that you sailed away, I know, mm -hmm. but that was another thing. Man's quest to have a seaworthy boat began thousands of years ago, and man's greatest skills were combined and put together to make a boat that could actually go out on the sea and survive any weather and arrive at another place where they wanted him to. I'm Reed Stowe. My family is from North Carolina. Sonia and I are preparing to go a thousand days at sea without coming to shore or receiving supplies. This will be the longest non-stop sea voyage in history whereby we depart the terra firma longer than any humans ever have. We won't ever come near the land or touch the land. We won't ever receive supplies. We'll be eating everything that we bring with us and fish we catch and rain that we catch. It's never been done before. So I don't know. I don't have a book to follow. And I don't have anyone coming to tell me what to do. And so I'm trying to figure it out the best way possible working as hard as I can with the means that I have and the help that I have. So we hope that we're going to be able to go in the next month. But we need good luck, more help, a bit more money, and things to go our way to make it happen. It's, it's also a voyage of self-discovery. And uh, in a sense, what could be a spiritual voyage for our times. People who are questing for other knowledge uh, would often go on a journey of some kind. So this journey is symbolic of all of those great journeys that people have taken in the past in, a, in the quest to know the inner mind of mankind. We're talking with Sonia Ahmad. Here we are. We're back again now. They're having a little trouble with their... Fellas, if you can, in the booth, if you can get that second one going and can do it with a consistency and so forth, go ahead and do it. Otherwise, we'll just continue with the mm -hmm. talk and so forth. And that was an exciting thing was over that. And he's just crossed the um, thousand day mm -hmm. mark now. And um, he's not, he'll be coming. Is it a definite date that he'll come back? To New York? Right. Um, June 17th is the date that we have so far, and mm -hmm. it's looking pretty definite. Mm -hmm. um, so June 17th, Reed is going to come sailing back and um, into New York City Harbor, mm -hmm. and we hope that it's going to be a huge event. We have planned... I should think it should be picked up on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. We have yeah. planned uh, a flotilla, mm -hmm. which is like a little boat parade going up the river um, yeah. to accompany Reed as he comes in. And if you want to be part of, if you would like your boat to be part of that, mm -hmm. Flotilla, you know, um, email me mm -hmm. um, on the website. You'll find my email. And, yeah, and again, the thousand uh, it's uh, thousand days dot net. Mm -hmm. One zero 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 d a y s dot mm -hmm. n e t. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And um, besides that, we're also uh, planning a party for afterwards, um, and there'll be a press conference, and there'll be uh, various press, whatever we can get there, mm -hmm. and um, hopefully it'll be uh, you know a big event. It sure should be. I think it's uh, incredible that there isn't more attention. I congratulate you and Reed enormously on pulling that off. He's such a good mm -hmm. guy. Thank I you, really yeah. love Reed, though. Mm -hmm. He's a beautiful guy, and he also has this ability to, um, to, to, to go ahead entrepreneur, and do something and get something done on his own. He's very mm -hmm. entrepreneurial in that sense right. and very individually oriented in the mm -hmm. sense. One of the things is when you're out at sea and you're away from land, that's a whole different, it's like some people have compared it to a biosphere. And maybe people are familiar where they had the thing down in Texas where people set up a dome and they had a living thing where they could live off everything within the dome and so forth. But it's like a biosphere on the oceans and you have to have water, you have to have food, you have to have all the things. There's no corner store to go down to to get right. resupply or mm -hmm. anything like that. That must be, is that a wrong comparison, do you think? Um, I, I suppose there are a lot of parallels between a biosphere and um, um, uh, endurance sailing. Yes. And um, I guess uh, the biosphere is uh, a practice to go out into space, be on another planet, and inhabit that other planet. Yes, that's what was so the, Mars, um, the idea of Mars. Right. right, so the Mars Ocean Odyssey, which is what we subtitled this thousand days, is a similar in, in that you, you can study what it would be like for an astronaut to be in 
a space shuttle mm -hmm. on a long space voyage, for instance, to Mars, and what kind of psychology they must have to be in that confined space for months and months at a time, to um, have to always be ready to face anything, um, and, and to uh, be creative in the, in the solutions that they come up with, to use the resources that they have on hand. There are some parallels between a long endurance sailing and um, being in, say, a space shuttle. How do you handle it there? Let me ask you a couple of simple things. You had enough experience. Water is a necessity. Mm -hmm. Did you have, you, you did have electricity from solar panels mm -hmm. that could yes. power your computers enough. Yes. I know you had a little stove, mm -hmm. a, li a, a little uh, stove, a wood stove that you could uh, do to get heat when it gets cold because mm -hmm. it sometimes gets cold. I talked to Reed, what do you, where do you get the wood? And he said, well, you just aim down to the mouth of the Amazon River and the wood <laughs> comes floating by. You know, it's, it's a different kind of well, take on Well, he's everything. not, he's, he, we didn't go anywhere near land and he, w he wouldn't do no, that. No, you could be so, hundreds of miles out to so sea in front of the So we took a Amazon lot, Asian. we took a lot of wood with us. Yeah. And we took a lot of coal. And so between the wood and the coal, we had heat. Um, and we also took 30 bottles of propane gas. So we had gas to cook with. Mm -hmm. And um, water, we would spread um, large vinyl tarps on the deck, and it would catch the water, and we'd funnel it down into it our water tanks. It water from rain. Right, rainwater. Now, uh, is there enough rain coming down to give you water in a, a, a yeah. enough abundance? It depends, it depends on which part of the ocean you're in. It would because so some places get more rain if than you're, others. If you're in, a, in, say, around the equator, a little bit north or a little bit south of the equator, you can get a good rainfall that'll give you hundreds of gallons of water at a time. Now you have tanks to hold it. Then. Yes, we have um, four tanks, and uh, their combined capacity is 1,200 gallons. Okay. So that's enough water to last us about six months. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, before we have to refill. You um, had that filled as you sailed down the yes, river. Yes, we of we course. filled it at, uh, on with land, New York City and water. then <laughs> with New York City water. <laughs> yes, it's good water. Yeah. It, it must be because we survived. All right, and then <laughs> good. Yeah, and thrived. Yeah. yeah. And then and then we went off uh, on on the ocean and. Um, we would catch small amounts of rainwater, but I think it was probably about six months before we actually got a really good big rainfall. Couldn't and then we refilled all our tanks. If you were running low, you get movies about Captain Bly set aside, set up, and I heard you say he was a thousand, Reed, was a thousand miles from land. Everywhere. The <laughs> Pacific Ocean is so vast. Yeah, it's know, like two Atlantic Oceans almost. Yes, I know. <laughs> but, the, but the image we have of, uh, you know, Captain Bly set aside in a boat and they're going to go, or Lifeboat, the film Lifeboat. Did you ever see the film Lifeboat? No. Oh, you want to see it. It's a great <laughs> film. But anyway, um, uh, but you're there and, you, you know, there's no water. Everybody's, but you're going to get, but you have the ability to go where the water is. So yeah. if you had a real problem with water and you got a lot of time, and I want to know how and you And we do have a lot of time. You have a lot of time, <laughs> so you want to uh, contemplate. You could see you know, a lot of spiritual things you could do, mm -hmm. meditation, all kinds. Oh. But that's another issue. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, you could just steer the boat. Like when I said, what do you haven't got any wood? You know, and he said, well, you just, he told me, he said, well, you just, let's go. And how long, how long does it take to get from one point to another is another thing that's hard for us landlubbers to understand. But suppose you're in the, I don't know, let's just say the middle of the Atlantic Ocean or something, and how long would it take you to get down uh, 100 or 200 miles off the, co off the Brazilian coast where the Amazon spreads out? Because he said you go down there and the logs, great logs and great <laughs> lumps of wood uh, will come floating by. Yeah, you um, know, you could just go, or you could do the same thing if you knew where the rain was. You could mm -hmm. go, and you wouldn't have to worry about water. You just go to where the water is. Right. And how much of that is part of the <clears throat> context in which your decision making and what you're doing? Or maybe there's a place where there's a lot of fish. You could catch fish to eat, I guess. Mm -hmm. Or well, what are some of the realities well, in, of yeah. being actually on the oceans of the world? Mm -hmm. Well, okay, uh, we catch rainwater when it rains and basically that depends on whether it's um, not that much wind that accompanies the rain and you know how much rain falls okay. so like when we were in the southern ocean yeah. um, it was very hard to catch rain even though it rains all the time why because it would be accompanied by so much wind okay. that um, first of all you don't want to spread out your rain tarps because it would just like you know it, it would be dangerous it could okay. rip the material and secondly um, 
the motion of the boat was so much that nothing would stay in. in and the rain's usually and, accompanied by large waves and the stormy weather. And, uh, I guess that's true. The biggest one, all the biggest de determining factors of how much water you can catch is whether the wind mixes the salt water in with the fresh water ah. and then you can't drink it. Uh -huh. So in the Southern Ocean, it rained all the time, but we couldn't catch it because of those reasons. So we, um, Reed actually caught water more when he went back nearer in the middle of the oceans, nearer to the equator. And that's when he was able to catch more water. Good fresh water. Yeah. Isn't it interesting the way they provide fresh yeah. water right out of the sky? Right. Well, you yeah. know, it's a big ocean, it's yeah. full of water, but <laughs> It's not, there's not drinking water everywhere. I yeah. know, yeah. Desalinization. You didn't have anything desalinization we did have, on board. We did have a desalinator do. on board. You did. Did it work? It or did, did you use it? It did work. And right after I left, Reed started using that because um, we had been running low on water. And he was in the Southern Ocean. He would be in the Southern Ocean for a while more, a few mm -hmm. more weeks before mm -hmm. he could move upwards. Mm -hmm. And so he did start to use a desalinator. But mm -hmm. after a few months, the desalinator broke down. Um, but it wasn't a huge catastrophe because by that time he was in, the, in a spot where he could get rain. And so he refilled his tanks with rainwater. Mm -hmm. But for a, for a time, he was using perhaps about two gallons of water a day, which is Not a crazy much. number for us on land to think about. I mean, just, you know, That's when one you... One flush of a toilet. <laughs> The toilet uses more than that to flush. Uses more, you know? okay, yeah, right. So uh, yeah. when you think about how much water you use in a day and mm -hmm. think about, well, what if, you know, you had to conserve it a lot and use only what you needed. But how big know? was the tank that it held? You said it was 12,000 12, gallons? 1,200 gallons. 1,200 gallons. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a lot of water. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. it's pure? It's all drinkable? It right, right. It doesn't get right. corroded or anything? No, uh, we uh, put uh, chlorine in it, and there's uh, pieces of silver in there, which is um, good to yeah, to keep the water free from bacteria. Mm. So it's it's pretty good. Yeah. See, this is all part of the ship-shaped way of living. And, and it's and ecological yeah. lessons you're learning, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And how to, to do it. What about uh, sustenance in terms of food? Well, fish. Are there fish that you can catch? Is that yeah. reasonable? Yeah, there's plenty of fish um, that, well... <laughs> well, first you have to get your fishing technique down, and then you can catch the fish. Did you get the fishing technique down? Reed got it down. Reed got it down. <laughs> okay, yeah. Yeah, um, and we only caught fish when we needed to, and uh, yeah. the fish that we caught were mostly mahi mahi. What's um, a mahi mahi? Oh, it's a also known as rainbow fish. It it's a very beautiful fish. It comes about 30 pounds, 40 pounds each fish. 30 pound fish? Yeah. That's a big fish. Yeah, you can you can see pictures of it on our website. Oh, um, good. Yeah. I guess we can't get to it. Yeah, okay, um, yeah. And um, when they die, they're, when they're swimming in the water, they're very colorful. They can be, have hints of emerald colors or yellow, shiny yellow mm -hmm. or blue, yeah. like a very beautiful electric blue. But mm -hmm. when they die, they turn gray. Um, and it's a very interesting to watch the transformation, you know, from that colorful fish to a gray fish. But, but is, I, it, is it entered into the na uh, the world diet? Do people, is it Yes, a, a lot of people, with? yes, you can go yeah. to the market and get mahi-mahi. You can get yeah. it there, and that's something you find a lot of on the oceans of the world. Is that tropical at waters? Does it vary which waters um, you're we've, in? We've seen mahi-mahi in cooler waters as well. Technically, they, uh, as far as we know, they don't really go much into cold water, but we've, we've seen them a pretty high latitude. Can you do a, yeah. a line and tackle, or how do you do it? Or do well, you have a net, or um, how does it call? He knows how to do it. Yeah, Reed uh, has a fishing it's line. It's like Robinson Crusoe <laughs> or something, you know? It is, it yeah, is. Yeah, right. He has a fishing line, and he throws it. He holds the line in his hand, and, and then he um, brings it in as fast as he can, and the fish bites on the bait, mm. and, you know, he just uh, flips it over onto the deck, and he wears gloves. He doesn't, he doesn't have a, re a, a rod and a reel or anything? Well, I think uh, the fish was probably a little bit too heavy for the rod and the reel, and wow, he has yeah. to um, lift the fish up over the lifelines of mm -hmm. the boat. Mm -hmm. um, and this is the method that he found works for him. I mean, it and, works, huh? and, and you got 30 pounds of fish. Right. And it lasts a long time. Yeah, so we eat what we can for the first two days, mm -hmm. and then um, he, we dry it in the sun with salt, and we preserve okay. it and put it away, and I'll we have fish. Darn. So you're just <laughs> doing that as well, making your own supply for a longer thing. Right. You can do it. Yeah. Then you had you had a lot of, uh, what do you call them, um, 
uh, uh, beans, beans, <laughs> and also sprouts, right? Right. We sprouted the beans that we had, and then um, sometimes we would cook it, and most times we would put it into a salad, and it would accompany our other rice and beans. So we'd have sprout salads. Well, if you have a salad, where do you mm -hmm. get the lettuce? I mean, I it's think it's not lettuce, a lettuce. lettuce. It's a sprout salad. A sprout salad. Yeah, okay. we have. <laughs> Thank you. You see, it's my 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 lame thinking. Yeah. Right. Okay. We have. Um, uh, Fenugreek sprouts, and we have mung bean sprouts and lentil sprouts. Those mm. are our three main ones. And, they and come we'd sprout all of them, um, and, and we'd put a little bit of each in, in, in a bowl mm -hmm. and put a little bit of um, vinegar, balsamic vinegar and mm. oil, and mm -hmm. maybe some toasted sesame seeds, and we'd have a salad, and I'll it's very down. delicious. That's okay. That's mm -hmm. really good, right? And, that we, and that's your creating a source, then, right? Right. What about, they used to worry about scurvy and that. Did you have mm -hmm. to take lemons or do you have vitamin C? Do you have vitamins or, or medical stuff? Do you have a medical kit, I presume, with the We had vitamins, you know? but we didn't really take the vitamins when you we were not. on there. Um, we had a medical kit, um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, complete with everything one might need in an emergency. Mm -hmm. um, and we had a book that, you know, uh, would tell you, first aid. yeah, a first aid book. Yeah. Um, but we, we both um, went over you know, potential injuries and what we would do in, in case, you know, before we even left. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, all of that. And then you've got a lot of time on your hands, although it takes a lot of work. You have to keep the sails in repair. You have to have the right weather so you can do that repair. There's a lot of things that you have to keep ship shit. You have to make sure of any possible leaks or any structural damage to it because you're out there in the middle of the ocean. Mm -hmm. And you weren't really, were you in any kind of a way in touch uh, emergency. Let's suppose, you we, know what I mean? We had an EPIRB. Well, what is the what? An EPIRB is a device that um, you, you put it on and it sends out a signal mm -hmm. and any passing airplane or ship would pick up that signal. Well, what if you're a thousand would, miles from an airplane or a ship? Well, you'd have to wait until you think you're, you're in a shipping lane or... Um, you want to avoid shipping lanes though, don't you? Well, yes, usually, but if it's an emergency and you need help, those shipping lanes are where the ships are. They can take you to safety. Okay, you got a problem. You're away from land mm -hmm. and you're away from it and you're away from civilization, let's just say, or mm -hmm. from the normal world. And that's what's unique about it. And you want to stay away. You don't want to run into it. You don't want one of those boats to run into you. I think you did have one. <laughs> yes, we did. almost yeah. out, of, uh, out of the dock. Yes, 15 days out, we were involved in a collision with the freighter. That's um, a big thing compared to your 70-foot school. Yes, freighters it's like are... like a Mack truck to a Volkswagen. Yeah. yeah. Or worse, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, they're huge. Yeah. Um, I, I'm not sure how it happened exactly. You broke a sail or something or a rig? We or? broke the um, bow sprit, which is um, a metal fitting on the front of the boat mm -hmm. uh, that holds the outermost sail, the mm -hmm. frontmost sail. And that was bent completely out of shape. You had to fix it. And we had to make some kind of repair. It wasn't completely fixed, um, but we Reed was able to make a, a repair that allowed us to keep going after that. You had that. to keep going and doing it there on the boat. Everything yes. had to be done on the boat. Yes, we Did had a the lot African of... African Queen, the movie The African Queen? Uh -huh. Remember that? Mr. Allnut, can mm -hmm. you fashion a torpedo? <laughs> and there, they were there, and they had to do it. They had to do it. At least they got up on the land. They could make charcoal or something. Yeah, that but that's you're doing everything on a boat. On a boat. And there's not, in, there's not a lot of space on the no, deck of the boat. So we, we did have to move some big pieces of things. And mm -hmm. <laughs> um, it wasn't... It wasn't it, it, Reed had to be very creative in order mm -hmm. to do that. Mm -hmm. um, he had this whole system of ropes and pulleys that he would move big things around with. Okay. And, um, it he was, worked that out over a period of time. Well, yes, he's been, he's been, well, he doesn't normally do big repairs on a boat. You know, he would try to take it to land if he could. Um, but you can if you're but, a thousand right. days. So I've uh, had some experience with making repairs at sea, and, and he does a lot of work on the boat while he's on the dock. Too. I think he's, yeah, but he has, but he has, days. right, and he has some, he's made us a, a system yeah, of exactly. moving things around yeah. and with the ropes that That's he has. Inventive. So, right, so mm. being at sea, you know, he just put more of that into practice. Okay, now what about the idea of all the time? You, you've got all this ship shape and you got the beans and you got the thing, and then uh, he's art mm -hmm. and he's also sculptor, so doing that kind of creative stuff is something you could do. Also, reading and mm -hmm. that. 
Is it good to be, uh, uh, you're out of touch, you're not in touch with the internet, no. you're out of touch. Yeah. Is that part of the discipline? Um, yes, that was, well, we told people we didn't really care about hearing the news of the world mm -hmm. and um, Reed has never... Pretty depressing by and large, yeah. Reed has never been into that no, um, I know. Yeah. himself and mm -hmm. I, I'm not much into it either. Mm, yeah. So um, for both of us it was not a huge sacrifice, you know, and um, being at sea, you really get to understand um, the here and the now. You know okay. what's in front of you and what you have to do to get Absolutely. through it. You don't. Your mind is not going back to all these abstract ideas. Meditative? Do you do meditation? Yes, do you um, we we did it? yoga and we yeah. did meditation on the yeah. boat. And right. Reed has continued that. He's he does yoga every single day. Yeah. Okay. Um, and it keeps him fit and limber yeah. and and able to move. And it you know it's like an athlete stretching before the event. Yeah. So you don't harm yourself, right. you know, um, uh -huh. so reads on a boat at sea, you have to be ready at any time of the day mm -hmm. to move quickly and, and to, um, you know, set sails or to respond to whatever situation comes up. So he does the yoga to keep fit in that way. Uh -huh. And then also, do, is there a question of boredom or no. is that, you're not bored, you weren't we bored were for never, 360, no. never bored. Nope. There's a lesson in that. He wasn't either. Boredom is not a problem. A lot no, of people there's, say, there's what a lot of do? work to do. I don't have do. television. I don't have connection. Or I don't have Times Square. And there, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But it's a different kind of status, right? Yeah. Um, we had a, a lot of work um, maintaining the schooner. And yes, I of think Reed, Reed had this list that he would add to every day, and, and the list got longer. Um, quick, more Repairs quickly. And things. Yes, yeah. more yeah. quickly than he could actually cross the items oh, off. Really? So he was always overwhelmed with a lot, of, a lot of work. And, and it was only till oh maybe six months ago that he was able to slow down and paint more and be a little bit more mm -hmm, yeah. Yeah. and be a little bit more contemplative and not so, um, you know, working all the time. Yeah. And I think that has taken a toll on his, on his physical self because, you know, he had sore arms and sore wrists and um, he still had things to do, you know, and that's very tough to keep going day after day after day like that. And I suppose, it, the, uh, when did he build that, Anne? It was a long time ago. Yes, she's it, getting on in years, I yeah, would think. And things do the, wear out. I notice things wear out where I live all the time. You yeah, know, it's it's a 30-year-old boat. Mm -hmm. He was built, it was built in 1978. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, read did replace almost every part of the boat before leaving. Mm -hmm. But still, you know, there are certain parts that just right wear out at, at, with time. Right. Well, God bless Reed. <laughs> God bless you. May bless, and, and may the people take it, uh, account of this incredible thing that's been done a thousand days. Congratulations, you and all the ground crew, yeah. and particularly to Reed and to you. Yeah, thank and you. And congratulations mm -hmm. on the baby. We mm -hmm. look forward to June when he comes back to yep. a rousing a world, I would hope, recognizing the incredible contribution of this fellow Reed Stowe and his lovely uh, companion. Uh,